we've been shaped by stories our entire lives. When we were younger, they were read to us at bedtime. They come from our teachers in class and friends in hallways. We see them in our favorite movies and TV shows. We relate to them, visualize them, and share them. Jesus understood this and chose to teach through stories. We've been shaped by stories our entire lives, but the stories told by Jesus were meant to give us life. His stories were called parables. Well, Happy New Year, Hope Church. How are we doing? We're doing well? It's good to see you back in 2019. It still feels really weird to say 2019. I don't know about you, but I have not been able to actually write 2019 down yet. I've gotten it wrong every time this week that I've tried, but I'm just glad that you're here. If you are a guest with us, or maybe you're just coming back in and check us out, man, you've picked a great year to journey with us here at Hope Church. I honestly believe, I know I say this all the time, but I believe this is going to be our best year yet as a church, as a ministry. We are launching our, our first, second campus as a church over in Mebane in 2019, which we're really, really excited about that. It's coming in the fall. As well, it, it's hard to believe if you've been with us that we are winding down. We are in the last six months of this three-year journey we've been in as a church. And so as we head into next fall, we got some really exciting things on the horizon right here for our Burlington campus. And so we just believe, man, through what God is doing here, there are some great, great, great things in store. And so I'm just glad that you're here. If you're just checking us out, man, again, I'm glad that you're here today just hanging out with us. If we're, if we're not the church for you today, I just want you to know this. I want you to find a place that you can get involved in, get plugged in. There are some great churches in this community. I just want you plugged in somewhere. I want you to kick this year off with church being a priority for you and your family. And so if this is your home, I want to encourage you, man, to make this year a year where you set up camp, where you dig your roots in a little deeper, where you take some steps, where you get involved, when you make this really your home. And if it isn't your home, let us help you find a home. But again, we're just glad that you're here today. We are kicking off a brand new teaching series today called Parables which is all about stories that Jesus told to make the Word of God very applicable and practical to people's lives. And so before I get started, I just want to ask you a question. How many of you today, how many of you love a good story? You love to hear a good story. How many of us? We love to hear a good story. Yeah, I love stories. I love listening to storytellers, right? Like if I'm learning something in class, in college, or at school, or even at church, everything else is just information to me until somebody shares a story, right? It's all just information. And then when someone can share a story, and if they're a good storyteller, it'll draw me in, right? It'll get me to a place where they take that information that they've been sharing, and all of a sudden they'll share a story, and all of a sudden I'll be able to put two and two together, right? I can put myself in that situation, in that moment, and it just ties it all together. How many of you would consider yourself a good storyteller? How many of you are good storytellers, right? Just a few people in the room right? Some of y'all got some stories you can tell, and even if you've told that story a hundred times, right? Maybe you got 10 or 12 stories, and they always come up, and everybody in the house is thinking you've told this story a million times. People still tune in, right? Because it's funny when you tell it, and you're a good storyteller, and people hang on every word, and if you're a really good storyteller, it gets better and better as time goes on, right? There's more details that come out. Story gets drawn out a little better, right? And so we love good storytellers, I love, again, I love being a storyteller. I want to get better at telling stories because I think people connect with telling stories. Now, I don't know how you grew up in church. I don't know your church background. But when I grew up in church, there was a lot of information, a lot of information. I was given a lot of stuff. There wasn't a lot of application. There wasn't a lot of relevant stuff. It wasn't very practical. There wasn't a lot of stories to be told. So I struggled growing up in church because I felt like the Bible was so distant so far away. I didn't really, I could ever really understand the Bible. I grew up in a church where it was King James Version only, which is fine. If that's how you grew up, that's how I grew up. Spoke in a language that I did not speak in, right? And we would just kind of go verse by verse, and it was just kind of like, if you could keep up, you keep up. And if you couldn't keep up, then you had to find some other time somewhere else to figure out what the pastor was talking about, right? And so we would have other opportunities where you would have to come back during the week to try to figure out what you were learning. And so we just said this as a church, When we started our church years and years ago, we said this. We said, we are not going to make it difficult for people to understand God's word. We're just not. We're just not. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna die on that hill. In fact, there are people that will come here and say, I can't come to this church. They'll say, I'll say, why? Well, I'll say, because you guys make it way too practical. Make it way too relevant. 
And I remember when we first started our church, we moved here in 2006, started a church in 2007. Our first Easter was in 2008, our Easter services. Some of y'all are with us then, you remember this. I had a family that came up to us after the service in the lobby and said, Pastor Tad, this is a great church. We love this church. They said, but we can't come back here. And I said, well, wow, what's up? And they said, it's just, you made the Bible too easy to understand this morning. And this is, I'm not even exactly, this is not a pastor story. This is word for word what she says to me. It's the wife of the man, the wife and the man standing there talking to me. She says, you made the Bible way too easy to understand today. I said, what? She said, yeah, yeah, like I have this Bible right here. And she said, and you're speaking in a language that's like normal language. And she said, I just don't believe, this is her word, word for, she said, I just don't believe people like me, just normal people, should be able to understand the Bible that easily. I said, man, my heart breaks for you, right? My heart breaks for people like that because, listen, here's what I've discovered in my time. I've been in ministry for a great deal of my life. In fact, being in 2019, I will celebrate this year my 20th year being in full-time ministry, right? Been in ministry a really long time, really, really long time. And I've discovered super religious people, super religious people. They don't like stories. You know what they like? They like a lot of information. In fact, the more information you can give them, the better. And the deeper and more confusing it is, the more spiritual they feel. Like super religious people, I think after church, they have conversations at lunch like, hey, church was great today, wasn't it? It was awesome. I have no idea what the pastor talked about. Wasn't it awesome? Yeah, it was awesome. I don't know what we're supposed to do about it, but don't you just feel more spiritual than everybody else? Because it was just so deep, right? I mean, I think people have those conversations, right? And see, the problem with this mentality, the problem with this way of thinking, the problem with this understanding is Jesus. And that's really the problem with it. People that think this way, the problem with that is Jesus. Because the the greatest storyteller possibly to ever walk the face of the earth was Jesus. Jesus could sit down in a moment and he would tell these stories that would draw people in. He could draw somebody in that had grown up in church their whole life, that had all the theological understanding. He could draw that person in. At the same time, he could draw in somebody who had never even heard the scriptures open their entire life, right? He could tell these stories that would confound people. Most often, these super religious people would try to catch Jesus in this moment with the trip of his theology, and he would begin to tell a story. And as he would tell a story, he would flip the script, and the story would actually be about the question asker more than it would be about the people hearing the story, right? He was an amazing storyteller, and Jesus loved to bring people in. Jesus would often share stories, and he would use these parables that we're talking about. And a lot of times we'll discover in the New Testament, these parables, these these stories that Jesus would tell were, were, were examples or illustrations or metaphors of horticulture or farming or gardening. And you say, well, why did Jesus spend so much time using metaphors about gardening and farming? Why? Because it was relevant to that day. Most people during that day were farmers or they were gardeners or even if they were fishermen, they had people in their lives that were around this economy of gardening and farming. And so Jesus used something very relevant to draw people in so that people could could find themselves in that store and he could take a really deep biblical truth and he could make it to where somebody could wrap their mind around it. See, if Jesus was alive in the flesh today here, presently speaking in front of you, he would not use horticulture examples. You know what he would use? Examples of like social media and relationships and marriage and health and time management and money. A lot of what we talk about here at Hope Church, he would find things in this book and he would tie them into real life situations and real life stories. And so that's what we're going to do. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at some of these parables that Jesus taught and we're going to dive into them. So what I want to do today is I want you to go ahead and get your Bible out. We're going to hang out today in Mark chapter 4. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. I want to remind you, if you don't own a Bible, this will be a great time for you to grab one of our free Bibles out in the lobby today. It's a brand new year, a fresh start, a clean slate. We would love to give you a free Bible today. Just head out to the middle of our lobby today. We'll put a Bible in your hand. If you don't want a, a, a kind of a hard paperback Bible in your hand, you want to have your phone, a digital phone, go ahead and download in the App Store, Google Play Store, the Bible app. I mean, already literally hundreds of millions of people have downloaded it. It's a free app. You can follow along. It's got Bible reading plans on every topic under the sun. We also put all of our notes in Scripture for you right there in that Bible app. If you don't want to do any of those things, it's fine. We'll continue to put them on the screens for you at home or in the house. And so let's pick up our story here in Mark chapter 4, beginning of verse 1 and 2. It says, again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd, a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat 
and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. So I want to just stop right there. Because what we discover is, just like we've seen all throughout the, Jesus' time, there's this large gathering that's following Jesus from place to place. A large crowd has followed Jesus, right? He's about to teach. Too many people have packed in, so he gets in a boat. He presses out to get some distance so he can begin to teach to the crowds. Now, one thing I want you to notice in Scripture is that there's a distinction that is given to us when Jesus is talking. There are times when, when we are told that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his disciples were those that were closest to him. They were his friends. The conversation was often a lot different. It was more insider. It was insider language. And there's a distinction between Jesus talking to the crowds and the disciples. Now, the crowds, as it tells us in this passage, most often when we see Jesus speaking in parables, the crowds were full of all sorts of people. You had followers of Jesus in the crowd. You had people who had grown up as biblical scholars in the crowd. You had non-religious in the crowd. You had doubters and skeptics in the crowd. You had people that were far from God in the crowd. And so Jesus would often use these moments, these teaching moments, to tell, parable, to tell parables to make these truths very applicable. Here's what I believe here at Hope Church. Here's what I believe. I believe on Sunday mornings, our responsibility is to teach to the crowds of people, to the crowds of people. Why? Because every single Sunday, whether you believe it or not, in a room this size, people that tune in online throughout the week, we have a mixed crowd of people. We have people who have grown up and gone to church their entire lives. We have people who have just started going to church for the very first time in their life. We got people who are, who are doubters about God, who are skeptics about God. We got people who are close to God. We got people who think they're close to God. We got people who are far from God. And so we believe Sunday mornings is our best opportunity to speak to crowds of people. And so we take biblical truths, and we work really hard Monday through Friday to make sure that we take these truths and make them very practical and applicable to people's lives. I'm not trying to impress you with a bunch of information. I want to show you the truth of what God has and how that applies to your life in your everyday, right? Now, you could be the first person to say, well, what about the disciples? What about those who are followers of Jesus? What about them? And I say, we have ample opportunity for people who want to take the next step in the walk with Jesus, to learn more about Jesus, to grow in their relationship with Jesus, we have ample opportunities for people to take those steps. Some of them happen on Sunday mornings. They just don't happen in this room on Sunday mornings. We'll talk more about that in just a few moments. And so Jesus is about to launch into this parable because he's teaching to the crowds, and he realizes in the crowds, I got people that are in all different uh, uh, parts of their journey, Right? The worst thing we could ever do in church is think that our journey is everybody else's journey, right? Start thinking because I've been going this way or because I know all this, then everybody else does as well. See, the longer you've been around, the more you should become aware of the people in the environment with you. And you should realize that, you know what, there's always something I can learn when God's word is opened. But this is also for the benefit of those who have never heard this for the first time in their life. And so Mark chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, Jesus launches into the story and he says this. And as a teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along a path, and the birds came along, and they devoured it. And so Jesus is going to jump into this gardening metaphor, this gardening illustration. He begins to talk about this sower, this farmer who's got some seed who goes out. He sows this seed. It falls on some hard ground. The seed doesn't have time to penetrate the soil. And some birds come along, and they snatch away the seed. Now, what we're going to see Jesus do in, in Mark chapter 4 is he's going to begin to give this illustration of gardening. Then he'll come back later in Mark 4, and he'll explain what each piece of the story means. And so look what he says here in verse 14 through 15. He says, the sower sows the word. He sows the truth of God's word. He is the one who is sowing out the hope of God, the message of truth that only God can bring. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, where they hear, and Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown to them. So before we go any further, what I want to do is I want to make sure that we all know kind of what's happening in the story, and I want to break down some terms for us so we all kind of have the, the same understanding, the same terminology on the same page. So if you have some notes, you can take some notes with us. You can write this down. The first term we see is the sower. Now, the sower in this story it's supposed to be us that call ourselves followers of Jesus. People that would call themselves Christians. That say that I've chosen to follow Jesus in my life. We are the sowers. And what do we call it as farmers or, or sowers? What is the seed that we're sowing? Well, the seed, the seed is the word of God. It's the truth. 
It's this message of hope. It's known as the gospel, right? It's the good news about what Jesus has done in my life, what he's done in your life, and the potential he has to do in somebody else's life, right? The soil in the story, the soil is the heart. It represents hearts. It's your heart, and it's the hearts of those around us. And our friends, our family, our co-workers, the people in our life. And so we have this illustration of the sower, the seed, and the soil. And what happens is is Jesus is going to give this illustration about how the word of God is given out by the sower. And how the sower, the hearts, receive the word of God. So he begins, again, with this this illustration of this this hard soil. This hard soil. If you want to write this down, you can. He begins with this, this illustration of hard hearts. He begins to look at what, what a hard heart looks like. Understand this, Judean farmland is much different than farmland we know today. So during this day, during Jesus' day, what would happen is you had people who had big plots of land. They either leased that land, they owned that land. And farmers would go out and they would just sow seed over all of their land. They would just throw out their seed everywhere. And what would happen is they would just throw up their crop anywhere and everywhere they could. Well, the, the, the problem with that is there were no real roads or paths during this day. So what would happen is if somebody's crop or somebody's farmland was blocking you from one point to the other point, so what you would do is you would just blaze a path right through the middle of their farmland. So what happened is somebody would blaze a path, and then people would use that path, and over time, what happens to that soil? It gets hard, right? A path gets beat into that soil, right? So Jesus begins to talk, and he says, he says you, you guys are familiar with this. Again, if you're out there and you're a farmer, you're thinking about all these people who keep making shortcuts through your field, and you have this hard soil, and you're all like shaking your head. I hate those people. I hate those people that keep using my farmland, right? He says, some of you, are, you're, you're showing seed, and you're throwing it on this hard soil, right? And, and, and it falls on the hard soil, and before it can ever penetrate the soil, birds come along, and they steal the seed. And you never get to to receive the crop. You never get the the harvest from that. And then he likens these birds to Satan. He says, for some of you, it's like going out and you're sowing your seed on the ground. And then what happens is what? What happens is birds come along and they steal it. And you never get to see the benefit of your investment. Because it's the same thing for us. Those of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus. We're called to sow this message of hope. We're called to cast out seeds of hope. And some of it falls on hard ground, on hard hearts. And before it has an opportunity to penetrate, sometimes Satan will cause a circumstance in somebody's life, a difficulty, a situation. And right when they get so close to hope that they can almost taste it, it gets snatched out of their life and it pushes them further away. How many of us know some people in our lives, some friends, some family members, some coworkers who have some hard hearts to the things of God? It seems like life has been so hard to them difficulties, circumstances, situations. You try to get in, you try to permeate their heart with this good news, this gospel of hope, this message that that could change their life. And it just seems like they're right there, but it's ever elusive. It just never seems to quite get in. Something always happens that keeps them from receiving the hope. Some people we know have hard hearts to the things of God, and and rightfully so, because they've had bad experiences in church. They've experienced people who claim to be Jesus followers, and have failed to properly be a reflection of Jesus. You ever met somebody like that before? You ever know people like that? That said they claim to follow Jesus, but then you look at them and you're thinking, no, 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 they treat you completely different than how Jesus would ever treat you. To the people who have had some bad experiences with church, they've been hurt by the church, they've been hurt by pastors and by denominations and, and by all these things and religion and all this stuff, right? They got all this baggage. And so the heart is hard to the things of God. Isn't it so disheartening for us to see people that we love and care about have a hard heart to the things of God? Maybe you have a child today who has a hard heart to the things of God. And it's discouraging, isn't it? You just kind of keep kind of sowing seeds of hope into their life, but sometimes it just seems so ridiculous, so pointless. Maybe you have a spouse who won't come to church with you seems hopeless sometimes, doesn't it? It just seems like you're the only one who cares. You're the only one kind of keeping the faith in your family. You're the only one kind of standing strong. You're doing it all alone, fighting the battle by yourself. Maybe you got a mom or a dad or a friend or a coworker or whoever it is that's in your life that, 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 that just won't receive hope. And sometimes it just feels hopeless. You just feel like you want to give up, right? You want to give up. Here's what I want to tell you. Listen, this is the truth about the truth of God's word. Hope is available to anyone and everyone. But this is the reality. 
Not everyone is going to receive the message of hope. That's just the truth. And it's hard for us to grasp sometimes. Some people will receive it. Some people will reject it. Some people will allow it to permeate their hard hearts, and some people will have hard hearts the rest of their life. They'll never be able to receive the fact that there is a God in heaven who loves them so much, that he loved them so much that not having a relationship with them was never an option. So he sent his son to them to die for them because he cares about them, to forgive them of their greatest sins, every sin they've ever committed, all because he desires to forgive them, to restore them back to his original intention, a relationship with him. Some people are like, I can't grasp that. I never will. Because this happened in my life. I experienced this loss or whatever it was. It's difficult. Let me like it this way. How many of you have ever tried to seed your yard before? Anybody try to ever seed your yard? It is painful, isn't it? It's painful. Like, I mean, like, literally, like, I told you guys before, we lived for 10 years in a house that, that, that had no trees in the yard, just one little tree they give you in the front yard that didn't grow for 10 years, you know what I'm saying, out there in the front yard. And, and we kind of had grass sometimes, and it would kind of come and go, and then we moved into a house that's got all these trees in the yard, and we got a new problem. It's called shade, right? I don't know what to do with shade because I can't get any grass to grow. I can get moss to grow like crazy, but I can't get any grass to grow. And so, listen, you name it, we've tried it. Don't send me any emails about tips. I'll just get mad at you because we have tried everything you can try, right? Tried everything. And here's the, here's the frustrating part. is grass always grows where I don't want it to grow, but I can't ever get it to grow where I do want it to grow. I spend just as much money every year buying grass killer as I do buying seed for my yard and fertilizer. It, it drives me bananas, right? It drives me insane. Me and Becky, right after the snow melted in our yard, the two feet of snow that we got earlier this year, we're looking at our muddy backyard, and we're like, we've got to do something about this yard. So you know what I know? This spring, right, we're going to plant seed again. Because I just have hope at some point this seed is going to get into the soil, and we're going to have some grass. I just, I'm holding on to some hope in my life that at some point we're going to have this beautiful lawn that we've always dreamed we could have. In the story, we are called the sowers of the seed of hope. You know what that means? We are called, when we go, no matter where we go, we're called to just spread hope. You walk around your yard, you're not thinking about where the seed's going, right? You're just spreading seed wherever you go, right? We're called to just sow hope. Some of the seed's going to fall on fertile soil. Some of it's going to fall on hard soil. Some of it's never going to take off. But we're called wherever we go just to sow seed, right? That's my responsibility. My responsibility as a sower of hope is not to be an inspector of the soil that I'm sowing the seed into. Now, maybe it is in your backyard, but it isn't in real life. I'm called to just sow seeds. I just sow seeds. I just keep sowing seeds. I keep sowing seeds, trusting that at some point there's the potential that one of those seeds is going to penetrate the hard soil. And at some point, there's hope. That seed's going to take root. That's going to produce something. I don't know what seed will and what seed won't. But I live with this hope that this seed will do what it's supposed to do at some point. If I just do my job, it'll do its job. You know why I have hope and hope today? Because let me tell you something. I was once a hard heart to the things of God. I don't know your story. I grew up a church kid. I grew up a pastor's kid. You couldn't tell me anything that I hadn't already seen before. I grew up in one of the largest churches in America. I saw the best communicators, heard the best music, heard the best of everything you could ever see from the time I popped out of my mom. I have seen the best of the best of the best of the best. You couldn't wow me with anything with church. You know what? I had so much church. I didn't need church. I didn't need God. Heard it all. Seen it all. Didn't need it. I saw hypocrites. I saw politics in church. I saw things I didn't like. I saw things that turned me away from the things of God. But you know what? There are people in my life that were persistent hope spreaders. And they kept dropping seeds of hope in my life. And you know what? At some point, there was a seed of hope that got into my hard heart. And it penetrated me. And here's what I discovered about hope. Once hope gets in you, you can't get it out of you. You can't get it out of you. So we live with this hope that even though there's some hard hearts in our life, I'm going to just keep covering that hard heart with the hope of Jesus. And so he begins his illustration talking about hard hearts. He's going to move on, and he's going to begin to talk about shallow hearts, right down to shallow hearts. Mark chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. He said, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up 
since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Now, maybe you've been there before. Maybe you've seeded your lawn and you fertilize your lawn and you've, you've limed your lawn or whatever you do, right? And come April or May, all of a sudden the rains come and this yard sprouts up. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've done this. All of a sudden I start believing like, yeah, we got us a yard finally. <laughs> The seed is too. We're going to have us this beautiful, beautiful lawn. And in April, May, and June, we have a beautiful lawn. And then what happens? July hits in North Carolina. <laughs> and you realize that the first three months were just fool's gold, right? You, you, just, you, you thought something was going to happen. It got your hopes up. And then you realize it is what it is, right? It's kind of like being a Carolina Panthers fan, right? Like the whole beginning of the season, you're talking trash. And you just believe things are good. And then you lose like seven or eight straight. And then you just realize that it is what it is, right? And so... I was going to use that illustration for Cowboys fans, but they finally won their first playoff game in like 40 years last night, and so I couldn't use that for them. And so what happens, right? Reality sets in, and you realize that, 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 that there was no, not enough root for that grass to make it. And then what do you do? You ride around town in some of these old established neighborhoods in Burlington. In the middle of the summer, right, they don't even have irrigation systems. They got this beautiful green grass, and you hate those people, right? You just hate them. <laughs> Why? What's the difference? It's the roots, right? It's, a, it's the fact that these yards have had time to establish. Their roots have had time to grow down deep. Their, their roots are at a place where they can weather the difficult hardship of the summer. They can, they can weather the droughts that we experience here in North Carolina sometimes, right? They can weather the storms, right? Their roots are down deep. They can draw the nutrients they need. They can sustain the growth, the difficulties, the trials, the hardships of life. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, Scripture tells us that God's desire is that our roots would grow deep down into him. That is, the seed of hope is scattered into our life, that it wouldn't be something that we just gather and did it quickly run away from. It would be something that we allow to, to marinate within our lives. We allow it to penetrate deep within us. That we take some time to grow in those things, to understand those things. Why? So that we can, we can weather the storms of life. Do you know there's a, there's a big difference, a big difference, and acknowledging the truth of God's word and surrendering your life to it. I believe there are a lot of people in the South who went to church a lot growing up, or even a little bit, who fully acknowledge the truth of God's word, but have never fully surrendered life to it. Sadly, I've been in ministry a really long time, and so what I've seen is I've seen people come in fast, man, in the church, places like this. They come into a place like this and their eyes get open to God, to the hope that he can offer, his message of truth and forgiveness and grace and mercy. Their eyes are open. They get excited. And they're, and they're on fire for God and they're excited, but it's just been a little bit of time. It's a little bit of the journey. And then what happens? All of a sudden, the newness begins to wear off and life begins to happen. Circumstances arise. Difficulties begin to rise. All of a sudden, all those past decisions they've made doesn't mean that God's not with them in it. It just means they still have to sift through some of that, that baggage. And what happens? It gets too difficult. And sadly, I've seen people as fast as they've come in, they've fallen away. Why? No roots. No time developed, no time seasoned to be able to withstand the storms and the difficulties of this life. Look what Jesus explains about this, this illustration in verses 16 through 17. He says, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. It says there's no root within them. The root is supposed to be within the word of God, the truth of God built up in him. But when it's not established over time, that's why I tell people all the time, you can't be a part-time follower of Jesus and expect to make it in this life. If you're just an occasional, come to church occasionally, open God's word occasionally, occasionally when you need something, I can promise you it's a difficult life. The Christian life is difficult alone in itself. Alone when you don't set up camp and set up roots in him. God desires that you would grow in him. You would grow in your faith and understanding and knowledge of him. You would come to know him in a deep, real, intimate way so that no matter what you face, no matter what hardship comes, you would know that you can withstand the storm because the one who calms the storms is always with you. You're set up in him. He never says that you're going to be free of storms or tribulation. 
It just says he's greater than the storms of tribulation in your life. He promises to walk through them with you. He promises to go through whatever that, that, that you need in life. We have an obligation as a church to help you grow. We take it very seriously. We want to help you grow. We want to help you grow in your relationship with God. But I need you to know this. As a follower of Jesus, you have an obligation to grow personally. It's not just my obligation. It's your obligation. You can go read 1 Peter chapter 2. It'll tell you a whole lot about this. It, it, it tells us an illustration. It says, just like you and I were babies, and as babies, we, we crave the milk of our mothers, right? And our mom has a responsibility to make sure that we're nourished and taken care of and that we're fed, right? But at some point, a mom's responsibility is not to just feed us any longer. It's to teach us how to feed ourselves. So it's the same thing for us as far as with Jesus. At some point, we move beyond craving somebody else feeding us, and we're supposed to crave the word of God ourselves. We're not supposed to just show up here and say, I hope he's got something for me that will sustain me the next seven days, the next six days of my life. I'm supposed to learn how to feed myself. I'm not supposed to show up to church every week on empty. Sometimes I show up full because I fed myself, and I'm just worshiping out of the overflow of what God has been doing in my life all week long. That God desires that you and I would grow in him, that we would know him. It's one of the reasons why we put so much stock and energy into Growth Track here at Hope Church. Growth Track is an opportunity for you outside of Sunday mornings to take steps in your walk with Jesus, to get the tools that you need, basic principles on just what it means to, to pray and how you can pray and how to begin to read your Bible and just really to understand Jesus and baptism and all these things that we talk about in Scripture. We have classes for that. In fact, they're starting up in a few weeks. We have classes to help you through your marriage, classes to help you through your finances, classes to help you overcome addiction or sin that has conquered your life for far too long. We have things to help you in this life, but I can't make you take that class. There's no skin in the game for me other than we want to help you. You have to have a desire to be able to take the steps that God desires for you to take, a hunger in your life to see God grow you in new ways. Last year, we had 70 adults complete one of our growth track classes completed. Let me tell you something. We had a lot more than 70 that started the journey. 70 saw it to fruition. You know why? Because it takes some time. It takes some weeks. It takes some discipline. It, it, it takes you being consistent, right? Those things are worth fighting for. This is the reality about life. Nothing ever gets healthier by accident. We got to grow. We got to put in the energy. We got to put in the discipline. We got to do what it takes. God doesn't want you to have a shallow heart. God doesn't want you to. We don't want you to either. Some of us have shallow hearts because we have a little bit of knowledge. On the flip side, there are people that I know that have an extensive knowledge but still have a shallow heart. There are people who have gone to church longer than I've been alive. They gather every week in little classrooms, and they got more knowledge and information about the Scriptures than I could ever even begin to tell you. They know theology frontwards and backwards. They've been gathering for 40, 50, 60 years just learning and learning and learning and learning, but yet they've never once applied it to their life. They never once lived it out. They can't show the hope of Jesus to anybody. They're not serving others. They're not even investing in his kingdom. They're just gathering in rooms, gathering knowledge. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with gathering and learning and growing. I've just said that. It's very important. But the Bible was not written so you and I could just gather in rooms and gather information. The Bible was written so that you and I could apply it to our life and we could get out of classrooms and go do something with it. How's the world going to be reached if we just keep shutting ourselves in little rooms, doing it to ourselves, and just surrounding ourselves with other people who think like us and look like us and act like us? That was never the mission of Jesus. He called us to be sowers of the seed of hope wherever we go, not just Sunday mornings at church. And so God doesn't want us to have shallow hearts. I don't want us to have shallow hearts. I know many of you don't want to have a shallow heart. God wants you to grow. Maybe this year grow like you've never grown in your life before. And so Jesus is going to address hard hearts and hard soil. He's going he's to uh, address shallow soil and, 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 and shallow hearts. And then he jumps into this issue of distracted hearts. Distracted hearts. Mark chapter 4 verse 7, it says, other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out. And as a result, it yielded no grain. It says other seed, it, it fell on, on some different soil. The first two soils we saw, what one, one was very hard soil, one was very rocky soil. Both are very difficult to get anything to grow on. Well, not impossible, but difficult. But this soil was different. It wasn't having a problem producing the nutrients that were needed because it says two things were thriving. The thorns and the weeds were thriving, but the seed was being choked out. 
Right before the seed could spring up and become what it was supposed to become, it says that something would come along and choke out the growth. What is Jesus trying to communicate to us? In verse 18 through 19, it says this. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. Listen. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word out. And it proves unfruitful. If I could just be completely honest with you, I will say this is where the majority of us, if we're not careful, this is the category in which we will fall into the most. Because many of us here today would say, I got the hope of Jesus, and I got faith in Jesus, and I believe in what he can do, and I believe in what he possesses. And so many of us, we believe in the potential of what Jesus can do in our life. And we have been so close to Jesus doing something great in and through us so many times that we can't even count. But let's be honest, we are so easily distracted by the things of this world and the busyness of our life and our schedules and what we have on our agenda. How many of us, we are out in the weeds and the thorns of life. We got faith. We got the potential of hope. We got the potential of growth. But we are constantly being drawn in and choked out by our business, by our finances, by our life, by our relationships, by all of these other things that are choking the life out of us that God created for us to live. How many of us are missing out on what God handcrafted and hand designed for you to do for your life because we got our own plans? Listen, there's nothing wrong with goals and ambitions and dreams and building and achieving. The problem is the pursuit of those things are robbing us and choking us from the life that God wants you to live for him. What has God uniquely wired you to do for him? What are you doing to advance his thing? How are you using your talents, your abilities, what God has placed inside of you to make a difference for him? How are you showing that seed of hope that he's given you? How are you using it for his advantage and not just for your own advantage? God wants to do more in and through us than many of us could ever imagine. This is the year for some of us to step beyond a season of allowing our lives to be dictated by our calendars and our busyness. And there maybe this is the year we start asking some things off so we can say yes to the things that God wants us to do in our life. Listen, we're all busy. Get in line. Come on, get, give me a break. We're all busy. You're not busier than anybody else. Come on, you're not more important than anybody else. We could go blow for blow. We're all busy. But let me ask you, are we so busy we're too busy for God? Can't even spend time with God today. I'm too busy. I can't be in a community group. I'm too busy. I can't serve. I'm too busy. I can't go on a mission trip. I'm too busy. I got too much going on. Ask yourself if God wanted to do something in you, is there even enough time in your life to allow God to do the work that He desires to do in you? God, what do you want to do? I'm either a clean slate or I'm not. I'm, I'm an open vessel or I'm not. I'm God, I'm, I'll allow you to use me or I won't. See, I think some of us would say that we're fully saved in Christ Jesus. And yet some of us are perfectly content with living fully fruitless lives. God did not create you. He did not send his son to invade this earth to give his life for you. So you could show up to church for 60 minutes a week, occupy a seat, sing some songs, feel good about yourself, getting some knowledge, and go home and go back to your life Monday through Saturday. There's no way in the world that you could believe that could ever be accurate. There's no way. He created you because he desires something out of you. He desires to do something great in and through you if you allow him to, if you allow him to. Jesus addresses these hearts. He addresses the hard hearts and the, and the shallow hearts and the distracted hearts. And then he closes with this look at a fruitful heart, a fruitful heart. Verses 8 through 9, it says, And the other seed fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. Now, again, if you're a farmer and you're listening to the story, and this guy's talking about seed that could give you 30-fold your investment, 60-fold your investment, 100-fold your investment. Man, you're, you're sucked into this. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? The farmer's got this one job to go out and sow his seed. Doesn't matter where it falls, he just goes out and he just keeps sowing. Some of it falls on hard soil, some of it falls on shallow soil, some of it falls on, on fertile soil, some of it falls out to the weeds and to the thorns, but you just keep sowing trust in God. It says that some of that seed that falls on this good soil produce a harvest. 
a harvest far greater than you and I could ever imagine. Verse 20 says, but those who hear, those were, uh, sorry, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word of God and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, when we have hearts to receive God's word, when we allow it to penetrate into our lives, God says, listen, that God can move something, bring something, grow something out of us that we didn't even think was possible. And that potential is inside of us. That potential is all around us and people all around us. You look around and you, you and I have a tendency to judge people by what we think their heart is, right? Oh, they got a hard heart. Oh, man, they got a shallow heart. Oh, blah, 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 blah. We, we, we were so good at looking at other people. He says, that's not your job. Your job is just to trust me. Your job is just to get out and just go so hope, to just trust in the power and the potential of what my hope can do when it gets in someone's life, when it gets in someone's heart. He says, don't discourage while you're sowing. Don't get discouraged. Maybe you're discouraged right now. He says in Galatians 6, 9, he says, don't grow weary in doing good. Because at the right time, you will receive a harvest if you do not give up. God has given us this mission. He's given us this heart to go out into the world and to be people who are sowers of hope. Let me just close with this really fast. Let me just show you this in illustration form. So this is kind of this reciprocated story that Jesus is telling us. We have the seed right first. The seed is this message of hope that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst, to give his life for me, to die for me. That's the seed of hope that we have. Seed, of, seed is cast out. It's given to people. It's given to hearts and lives. That's the soil, right? We either receive it or we don't. People cast it away or they don't. Some of us allow it to seep in and we grow and we dig our, our roots down deep. Not so we can get stuck in the soil stage. So many people are stuck there just gaining knowledge and gaining wisdom. And I just got to grow. I just got to grow. I just got to grow. No. Why? So we can go back out and we can be the sowers. We can go out and do the work. We can go out and cast the seed. Let's be honest. The, the sower could never be the sower if he hadn't first received the seed, right? So it just goes in this reciprocating format of we are people who are sowing the seed because we are people who have received the seed. We are people who are, who are casting it into the soil of people around us because it's gotten into the soil of us. It's permeated our hearts and we've grown and as we turn, we're on mission with Jesus. See, Jesus was a master storyteller. He started this story by, by, by talking to the crowds. But this was really a story of what it looks like to be a follower of his. See, at Hope Church, we define a disciple as someone who is choosing to follow Jesus, who's being changed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus. Look at it, look at it. It's the same thing, right? So the, the seed is someone who chooses to receive the hope of Jesus. I'm following Jesus. The soil is someone who's being changed by Jesus. I, I'm going to continue, not just a one-time transaction. I'm going to continue to be changed over and over by Jesus. Why? So I can just show up to church every week and go home? So I can just check my, my, my spiritual box? No. So I can be on mission with Jesus. I can be a sower of hope. I can get out into the world and I can tell people about the hope of Jesus. This is the mission that he's given us. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go into the world and make disciples of all nations. He backs up in a verse before that and he says, all the power of heaven is given to you, followers of Jesus, to go and make disciples of all nations. To go spread hope to anyone you come in contact with. So I want you to know something. Hope Church, we are committed more than ever to be sowers of hope, to spread the message of hope wherever we go, whoever we come in contact with. So we're going to spread hope, seeds of hope right here in Burlington. We're going to spread it through what we do here on Sunday mornings, what we do throughout the week, through our community partners like Sustainable Alamance, through the Salvation Army, through our Hearts Cry Pregnancy Center. We're going to spread seeds of hope. We're going to go to Mebane, and we're going to spread seeds of hope in Mebane. I don't know if we're going to stop there. We might go west or north or south and spread some more seeds. We're going to set spree, uh, spread seeds across the globe, right, through Second Chance Haiti and what God's doing in Haiti. All right, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna resource and we're going to spread hope. We're going to send people. We're going to spread seeds of hope through what we do in Ethiopia and sponsoring kids who, who, who are getting a chance to receive the seed of hope of Jesus. We're not going to stop. Why? We're not going to stop because we have the hope. We have the hope of Jesus living in us. This is Jesus' mission for us. Jesus himself came to be a spreader of hope. You could get really deep and theological if you want to get really deep today. Jesus was a sower of hope, but he was also the seed of hope he was spreading. How crazy is that? 
And as he said, as he spread these seeds of hope, it got into good soil. And it produced guys like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter, and Paul. People like you and me today. That's how powerful it is. And we're called just to do the same. So we're going to be sowers of hope because we've been receivers of hope. And we've never forgotten the potential and power of when a seed of hope permeates a heart, what God can do. Let's pray together. God, we are so thankful that God, every one of us at some point in our life have had hard hearts to you. Seasons of our life when we didn't even know that we needed you. Seasons of our life when we've tried to do our own thing, live our own way. It's so easy for us to get going in life and busyness and schedules and activities that our hearts can easily become hard to the things of you. We get immune to it as we've been going to church for so long. God, I pray right now that you would just sort of evaluate ourselves of where we're at today. Whether we're someone today who's got a hard heart, maybe we've never received you, maybe we have a shallow heart today, maybe we haven't grown in the things of you. Maybe we got a distracted heart today. We got so much going on, so many things that we're thinking about, so many goals and dreams this year. But yet, if we're really honest, we haven't created any room for you to do something in our life this year. Maybe what God's calling you today to do is, is a fruitful heart, a heart that can just explode for him, a heart that can be used for him in ways you never thought possible this year. It's time, it's time to stop having conversations about potential and what could be. Let's start talking about what God wants to do right now in your life. God, we thank you today that you make yourself available to us through your son, Jesus. You're not difficult to get to today. You've done all the heavy lifting, all the hard work. You've came to us. You gave your life for us. You died for us. And all we have to do today is receive your message of hope and grace and forgiveness and truth. God, I pray for those who haven't received that message today, they would put their faith and trust in you. For those of the have, that we'd be challenged today to move beyond just being recipients of hope and we would become spreaders of hope. In Christ Jesus' name. Amen.